Suspension, perhaps the most important part of an off-road build. The front seems like a good place to start, mostly because it's the easiest in my case. It's not done, but I have made some progress. I started this project a couple of months ago, and I had great plans for a specific organized video set about different topics coming out once a week or so, but of course everything has descended into chaos. Plans have changed, then changed back, then changed again. Designs are evolving, parts are being built, hopefully correctly. I have made pretty good progress on the front suspension. It's not done, but it seems like a pretty good time to make a video on it. The original plan for this car seemed pretty easy. New control arms, front and rear, new upright, some steel bumpers, and send it. And that's mostly what we're still doing. I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to use in terms of wheel size, tire size, shock length, manufacturing process, but the devil is always in the details. And the details go from vague to specific real fast. I did settle on tires and wheels. They're 17 inch KMC Technic wheels. I love these wheels. The car came with chrome five spoke and I looked at getting some black five spokes, but after some photoshopping, I decided on the Technics. My previous Viper was an ACR and the ACR Vipers came with these 10 into 20 spoke wheels. KMC sells a black off-road version of these wheels, which is perfect. For the tires, I'm going with Falcon Wild Peaks, specifically the AT3W. I did say in a previous video that I was going to go with mud terrain tires, but I decided against that for a couple of reasons. For one, they're pretty heavy. They're made for some extreme driving that the Viper is frankly not going to be able to handle. It is two-wheel drive, and I do have two spares, so I should be fine. They also have less road noise, they're better at snow and ice, they come in a size that fits the Viper better, so AT3Ws it is. Also, Falcon Tire and KMC Wheels are both sponsoring the build, so that's pretty awesome. I hate designing suspension. It's super hard. Everything affects everything else. You make one change and all of a sudden your roll center is in Phoenix. The best thing to do when designing suspension is to just find a car that does what you want your car to do and copy the suspension. Just wholesale steal the design. You could call this plagiarism or theft, but I'm going to go with reverse engineering. This has a couple of benefits. The obvious one is that I don't have to design suspension. I don't have to worry about roll centers or Ackerman or scrub radius. The other is that I can just use parts from that suspension. I can make uprights and control arms, but hubs and brake rotors and stuff like that is a lot harder and it's just easier to buy those things. So I did that. I started with the 4Runner since there is conveniently one in my driveway. I jacked up the car, took the wheel off, and got the suspension at its normal ride height. Here's an interesting thing. When you lift a Viper 10 inches or so and swap out the suspension for a 4Runner, the 4Runner upper control arm is in almost exactly the same place as the original Viper upper control arm. Neat. This is because the upright on the Viper is very short with the wheel mounting kind of in the middle and the 4Runner upright is very tall with the wheel mounting near the bottom. So we can just use 4Runner parts, right? Not so fast. You see, about this time I realized that my original plan for the rear suspension was not a great idea. We'll get into why later, but I decided to use a Ford Bronco rear axle instead. And if I was going to use that axle, I might as well see if the front geometry works as good as the 4Runner. So, I rented a Bronco on Turo, pulled it into my garage, and scanned the front suspension. And guess what? The upper control arm is pretty much in the same spot. In fact, the front suspension is basically the same between the 4Runner and the Bronco. Like, remarkably similar. Remember how I said it's easy to just copy someone else's design? Apparently that is a more common approach than I thought. But about this time I realized my plan for the rear suspension could possibly be improved by using the rear axle from a Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. We'll get into why in a minute, but if I'm going to use a Jeep Wrangler Rubicon rear axle, I might as well just use their front suspension too, right? Nope, it's a solid front axle and we're not doing that. I ended up with kind of a mishmash of Bronco and 4Runner geometry. Both of my control arms are a little bit longer, and the anti-dive on the upper arm is a bit different to align it with the frame. I thought about just using the existing upper control arm mounting points, but they don't look that substantial, so I decided to make new ones. I have a feeling that mounting these is going to be harder than it looks, but that is a problem for future Matt. I am using some parts from existing cars. The front hubs and brake rotors are from a Dodge Durango. This is, of course, keeping with the tradition of the Viper, which used many parts from other Chrysler cars. The original front hubs were from a Dodge Dakota, and I believe they used them later on the first-gen Durango. I think this means I am qualified to be an engineer at Dodge. Just kidding. I am way overqualified for that. Other parts, like the uprights and control arms, will need to be fabricated. This sounds complicated. Do I need a foundry to cast aluminum parts or a big CNC to mill them out of billet? Nope, I just need send, cut, send. The uprights and control arms are going to be made from welded steel. I'm going to make them boxed welded structures, meaning they'll be hollow, mostly. 
I am adding some bracing to the lower control arms. Boxed welded steel is great for these types of things. The structure is efficient, it's really easy to fabricate, you can dent it on a rock and it's not going to catastrophically fail. The first step in this manufacturing process is to design the parts. I have all the hard points, I got that from the Forerunner and Bronco with slight modifications. I moved the inboard pivots in on the upper and lower to get them closer to the frame. I also moved the hub higher. Usually you do the opposite of this on an off-road vehicle that doesn't have front drive shafts to get more clearance. Most of these trucks will have the lower control arm in line with the wheel center, but moving my hub higher puts the wheels and suspension inboard points exactly where I want them. This changed my scrub radius, which is the difference between the tire center and the pivot axis, but it's probably fine. I mitigated this a little bit by moving the upper outer ball joint outboard, but this changed my instant center, and you see you change one thing and everything else changes. Whatever, it's probably fine. I started with the upper control arm since that's the easiest and has the lowest loads. For the inboard, I'm going to use rod ends. These are great since you can adjust camber by just screwing them in or out. This is not the most efficient design since you have threads in bending. When you hit the brakes, the threads bend and all the threads get fatigued and after a while your wheel goes flying off. There is one solution for this problem and that's to just use gigantic rod ends. The outboard ball joint is a huge spherical joint. You can buy these with the housings already machined. The rest of the upper control arm is 8th inch steel. I just drew a kind of faceted U shape. This will weld directly to the outer ball joint housing. The rod ends will need some square threaded steel, but that's probably a thing I can make. The lower control arms were a little more involved. I could have made these flat, but adding this kink in here makes it look a lot cooler. Also helps with shock mounting. I'm using coilovers here and they're attaching here or possibly here, so there's a lot of bending load to this. I added some internal bracing, some quarter inch plate going from the ball joint up here all the way to the back here, and then I added some bracing all the way from the rear bushings to those plates. The outer ball joint is the same one I used on the upper control arm. The inners are just bushings with some welded steel sleeves I got online. So this is mostly a box, but with some serious bracing inside. The coilover mounts in this valley here. I put two locations because I haven't decided on which front shock I'm using yet, and I might be able to use the other one for the anti-roll bar mount. This was difficult to model. I had to make a shell and then go in and manually add tabs and slots so this would all nest together nicely. This all takes some time to do in design, but I promise it's worth it when it comes time to weld. The uprights are just a flange to hold the hub and the brake rotor and then some metal connecting that flange to the control arms. I could just weld a solid rod from the flange to the upper ball joint, but that wouldn't be an efficient design. It would be heavy and stupid. The better design is to move your material to the outside and create a box. This is a better design for reasons that I can't adequately explain because college was a long time ago. Something about load paths and second moment area of inertia or something. I oriented the lower ball joint vertically because it made it easier to mount with the upright. I could just draw walls on either side of the upright going from the top to the bottom. The bottom bolts to this spherical joint through these walls. Then I just closed off the front and back to make a big empty box. The top has a bolt going through it, so I made two shelves with a tube section welded through. This should adequately transmit loads between the box and the bolt. The bottom shelf has an extra piece of steel with a hex cut into it, so I don't have to get a socket up in there to tighten the bolt. This is probably going to be a pain in the ass to get together, since I'll have to get the bolt way up in there and then sort of keep it held in place while I add the nut on top. Oh, you know what I should have done is put a set screw in there to hold the bolt in place. Whatever, I'll figure it out later. For the steering, I designed a removable steering mount. This should allow me to replace the existing Viper tie rods with some spherical rod ends, and they will be right where they need to be for the existing Viper steering rack. I might change the rack in the future, and I might modify the exact location of the steering input on the upright. I did a quick and dirty kinematic build on this to make sure it doesn't have bump steer, but I'm moving pretty fast, so I'm just going to make stuff easy to change and hope for the best. The flange for the hub is half an inch. I just guessed on this. It probably could be thinner, but it's fine. In fact, I guessed on all of this stuff. I didn't do any actual engineering on these parts. Here's the deal. If you have a car on the road, you can find out the coefficient of friction of the tire and then calculate the maximum loads into the suspension based on that friction. It all works out until you hit a curb and the suspension sees a much higher load. You can also engineer the suspension to a specific curb height and speed into it. Car companies do this. It's harder to do this with off-road stuff since the desert is just filled with rock-shaped curbs. How do you design for a near-infinite collection of shapes and sizes of things to run into? You don't. You just make a guess and move on with your life. So I made guesses, I designed parts, and I ordered them. And then I got my parts and realized my guesses were way off. Everything was so heavy. So I went back and made several sheets thinner, added big holes to a bunch of things, and ordered replacement parts from Send Cut Send. I tack welded the upper control arms together, then I made a whole video about welding, and then I finished welding them. 
To attach the rod ends, I made some threaded blocks. I just bought an inch and a quarter steel bar stock, and I chopped it up. It took me a second to figure out why I smelled burning toast while I was using the chop saw. Do I have a sinus infection? Am I having a stroke? Then I remembered the last time I used the chop saw was to chop bread. Oh yeah. Anyway, I chucked up the bits in the lathe with a four-jaw chuck. I trimmed them to length, drilled them out, tapped them all, and then welded them into place. You can buy these, but I decided to just make them, and after buying the tap and drill bit, I managed to save $3, and it only cost me two and a half hours of machining. To weld these in place, I drilled a couple of holes in some aluminum angle and used that as a fixture so the threads would be parallel. I didn't want the distance between them to change as I threaded them in and out. But on the first one, I didn't tighten the nuts down and they came out slightly angled, just enough to where I considered leaving it, but it bugged me enough that I cut the ends off, clamped them down into my fixture, and re-welded them together. But if anybody asks, it's supposed to look like this. The lower control arms mostly just went together with the help of the little tabs. I did tack weld a piece of angle to the rear bushing mounts to keep them mostly in line. I assembled it all with the top in place, and then I took the top off to add some welds inside. This moved those pieces slightly, so I had to modify the slots in the top. This will probably make my welds look worse, but when has anyone ever commented on my welds? Actually, it took me a while to weld all of this up, and to be honest, towards the end, I kind of stopped caring about what the welds look like. But I am pretty confident that the welds are structural, and very confident that the weak point is not the suspension, but the frame that the suspension is going to be attached to. I didn't really finish designing this out before I sent out the parts, but I'm going to add sleeves here where the bolts go. On one side, it'll be big enough for a socket head bolt to get inside. On the other side, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do, a solid shelf of steel or something. I haven't gotten that far yet. The uprights went together pretty easily, except I got lazy when adding tabs in CAD. When I design this sort of thing, I usually just draw out a solid block. Let's say I want this wall to be an eighth of an inch thick. I'll just start a sketch on this wall, draw out the whole wall, but with some tabs cut out, and then extrude that sketch an eighth of an inch. Then you go to an adjacent wall and you do the same thing, but making a sort of negative tab to clear the other tab. Just do this on all the sides and you have a piece that will nicely nest together. Two things though. One, you have to have the slot bigger than the tab by something like 15 thousandths of an inch. Send Cut Send has info for this for all the materials on their website. And two, you have to remember to add the slot on the adjacent piece. I was in a hurry with this part, so I kind of just forgot to do that for a couple of tabs. This made it harder to weld things up, but it wasn't a huge deal. Here's the thing I'm going to start doing in the future. I'm going to start making these plates half overlap. So instead of a weld like this on a junction like this, I'll have parts coming together like this with a weld here. It's way easier to make a good looking weld with good penetration when you're filling a valley than when you're doing this kind of half side butt weld or whatever it's called. Anyway, adding all of these tabs and overlapping things like this in CAD is tedious. You have to set aside some time to do it, but I promise future welder you will appreciate it and it will make for a better part. The upper control arms will mount to the upper frame rail with these tabs welded on. I'm not sure how I'm going to locate these accurately. I'm also not sure what all I'm going to have to relocate. It looks like there are some important lines and wires in the way. I also made some flanges for the lower control arms to mount to. These come off the lower frame rail. I did plan on having bars go across connecting both sides, possibly with an X brace, but I think I need to make this removable. Not sure why, but it seems like it would be good to have access under here. Of course, I do own a Sawzall, so maybe I'll just weld them in. As for the shocks, I don't have them yet. I'm not even sure what I'm using. I'm kind of leaning towards some Fox Performance coilovers for the front, probably 8-inch travel. I could get adjustable, but I'm never going to adjust these things, so I'll probably save some money there. There is no shortage of off-road shock companies, so I just need to do some research and see what's actually good. Anyway, that's where we're at with the front suspension. There's still a lot left to do. I'll have a video on the rear suspension coming out soon, but I can get you up to speed with where I'm at with that right now. I bought an axle from a Jeep, and it's sitting in my garage. I hope I can make it work. Thanks for watching. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. Uh, gross. Aw, nice.